Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. You probably know by now that we study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this particular series is a series on the book of Jeremiah. Now you might have thought that Jeremiah was a little heavy, and in some parts of it it certainly is, but it has some challenging questions for us, so let's dive in. This is lesson number three in that series, entitled The Last Five Kings of Judah. Now, if you happen to have your lesson quarter, your Bible study guide in front of you, it will say the last five kings of Israel. But I know for a fact, and we're going to see in this lesson, that there's nothing about Israel in this lesson at all, so I took the liberty of changing the name to the last five kings of Judah. While we're studying those last five kings, or before we study them, let's offer the, ask the Lord to guide us and the Holy Spirit to lead us in our discussion. Our kind and wonderful Father, as we turn now to watch painfully the demise of your kingdom, Judah, of your people turning away and so they were more wicked than the Canaanites that were driven out before them. Help us to recognize their mistakes and not to make those mistakes ourselves is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, as the lesson clearly suggests, we're going to review the history of the last five kings of Judah. Human beings, we might conclude, are incredibly, incredibly good at rationalizing their mistakes and their sinful behaviors. Of course, none of us here would do that, right? I can't, before you, I think it might be um, enlightening for many of our viewers. You mentioned that this isn't Ju Israel. Mm -hmm. um, what? What, what, what's happened to Israel here? What, okay. what, can you give us just a little... Yes, a hundred years before this lesson that we're already studying now, a hundred to a hundred and twenty-five years prior to this, the nation of Israel was conquered by the Assyrians and disappeared into history. And this the, is The Assyrians the just scattered them, and we, we don't have any idea what happened to them after that. 722 B.C. 722 B.C., and, and now we're talking about 620 five down to we're going to go down to 587 and and what was had once been a unified nation right. the nation split into Israel and Judah how long Judah did, was the southern kingdom Israel was the northern and, kingdom and how long was Israel in existence before they I mean the the northern the kingdom, northern kingdom separated Israel, as a northern kingdom uh, uh, became a separate kingdom at the beginning of the reign of Jeroboam, so when Solomon died, Solomon died about 930 B.C., and they went into captivity about 722. Right. Mm -hmm. So what is that? A little over 200 years. So God's original unified people, at some point they, they divided some kind of a civil war or something, and then the northern part, the kingdom of Israel, just was extinguished just first. Down, 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 down. That's right. Down. And, and what we have left and what we're discussing now is what's left of the whole thing, which would be the southern the kingdom southern of kingdom. Judah. The southern kingdom, yeah. So, <clears throat> the Russian writer, Fyodor Dostoevsky, spent four years in a Siberian prison in the 1800s for subversive political activities. While in prison, he talked with many of the other inmates. This was his comment about them, after he was released from prison, okay? So now he's commenting about these other prisoners that he spent four years with. In the course of several years, I never saw a sign of repentance among these people, not a trace of despondent brooding over their crimes, and the majority of them inwardly considered themselves absolutely in the right. Mm -hmm. Knowing a bit about that uh, empire, I think May, and he that might these have been are political right. prisoners. He, they might have been right. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're not dealing with the gulags right now. Dostoevsky might just as well have been talking about the last four kings of Judah, the kings following Josiah. Despite Jeremiah's repeated warnings, they seemed determined to fall further and further into idolatry, abuse of their citizens, etc. But first of all, let's give a nod to Josiah. What do we know about Josiah? Good King Josiah. Good King Josiah. He was the 16th king to rule in the southern kingdom known as Judah. 
He reigned from 640 B.C. to 609 B.C. He became king at the age of eight. It is incredible that he was a relatively good king considering the fact that his father was Ammon and his grandfather was Manasseh. They were two of the most evil kings in the history of Judah. So how did they get a good kid out of that? Must have been the mother. Maybe so. Maybe someday we'll see her in heaven and can thank her for it. If, is there a couple of quick things you can mention about some of the good things that Josiah did? Yeah, we're, we're going to talk a little okay. bit about that right now. <clears throat> um, Josiah was, I mean, Manasseh was actually captured by the Assyrians, was in prison for a little while, and then released to go back to his people. And for the last five years of his, of his king, of his reign, he actually tried to try to fix some things. So maybe that had some influence on Josiah. I don't know. But the Bible says, as we know, uh, 2 Kings 22, 2, Josiah did that which was right in the sight of the Lord. And Ellen White comments about him with these words, born of a wicked king, beset with temptations to follow in his father's steps, and with few counselors to encourage him in the right way, Josiah nevertheless was true to the God of Israel. Warned by the errors of past generations, he chose to do right instead of descending to the low level of sin and degradation to which his father and his grandfather had fallen. He turned not aside to the right hand or to the left. As one who was to occupy a position of trust, he resolved to obey the instruction that had been given for the guidance of Israel's rulers. And his obedience made it possible for God to use him as a vessel unto honor. Prophets and Kings, page 384, paragraph 1. So, so maybe Josiah listened to the Holy Spirit. Yeah. And it, he would have thought that they would have learned something from that. Yeah. yeah his, his, his parents passed and he was under the care of, was it, a, was it an aunt or a maid? Or, or no, I, I think you're thinking of Joash. That oh, that earlier, could be. That king. could be. Yeah. <coughs> well, so in the eighth year of Josiah's reign, now he's how old? Sixteen. He's sixteen. He determined to worship the God of his ancestor, King David. I mean, you know, wow. You know, chalk up one for the teenagers. Over the next few years, he began to destroy the pagan places of worship, the idols of Asherah and Baal. And who were Asherah and Baal? Goddesses, God and goddesses of fertility. The God and goddess of goddesses of fertility and all the things connected with their worship. We need to remember that the northern kingdom of Israel had been destroyed and dispersed into Assyrian captivity approximately 100 years prior to Josiah's reign. It's actually a little bit more than 100 years. Well, no, a little bit less than 100 years. Uh, but he, he spanned from the beginning to the end, so it spanned the time when they were 100, 100th anniversary. The people, were living, the people who were living in the northern kingdom of Josiah's time were what kind of people? Mixed. What did the Assyrians do? In order to make sure there was no rebellion, no one could mount a rebellion against their government, when they conquered a nation, they would take most of the people from that nation and just scatter them through all their territories, and then they would take people from all those places and move them into the territory where those people had lived. So, what do we, what do we end up with? A hodgepodge, right? Social engineering. Social engineering. Well, the people who were living in the northern kingdom in Judah, Josiah's time were a mixture of foreigners and a few of the remaining people from the northern kingdom. But although he was not officially ruling over that territory, notice this very interesting stuff, he did not hesitate even to go into the far north, way out of his territory, destroying pagan temples, burning the bones of pagan priests on the altars where they had worshipped. I mean, imagine, this is like you know, someone from the United States goes into Canada, up to the very northern part of Canada, and says, you people are worshiping the wrong stuff. He destroys the temples. He tears everything down. It's amazing. Do we know anything about that? Was there any history behind that, his tearing down the temples and burning the bones of pagan priests? Well, it talks about it in Second Kings 23, 15 and 16, but there's some initial talk about it in First Kings 13, the 
First Kings 13 is a very interesting story. We don't have time to talk about it right now, but I'm going to read the first few verses of First Kings 13. Now, this happened in the days of when Jeremiah started the demise of the northern kingdom. Jeroboam. Jeroboam, I'm sorry. Jeroboam started the demise of the northern kingdom. And this is what it says. At the Lord's command, a prophet from Judah went to Bethel and arrived there as Jeroboam stood at the altar to offer the sacrifice. Now, Jeremiah, sorry, please forgive me. Jeroboam, the first king of the northern kingdom, is not only making golden bull calves, the new gods for the northern kingdom, but who's, who's offering the sacrifices? Straight he himself. He thinks he's good enough to be a priest and to be a king and to be everything. Following the Lord's command, the prophet who's come from Judah up there to condemn what he's doing, denounced the altar, oh, altar, altar, this is what the Lord says, a child whose name will be Josiah. How many years is this ahead of what we're talking about? We're now talking about a prophecy that got filled, what, 300 years later. Will be born to the family of David. He will slaughter on you the priests serving at the pagan altars who offer sacrifices on you, and he will burn human bones on you. So, what does that tell us about God's ability to predict the future? <clears throat> what do all the people say who don't believe God can predict the future? They say this was written after the fact and made to look like it was. Yeah. yeah. Good, 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 good try. Well, and, the, and so and so this Josiah goes with his his true all through the northern territories there, tearing down the altars, destroying every, everything that these people were worshiping, all these pagan gods and so forth, and cleans the place up. He ground the idols to dust and broke into pieces all the incense altars. Well, in the 18th year of his reign, a couple years later, after he had finished purging the land of, his, of its idols, he decided it was time to refurbish the temple in Jerusalem. While that was in progress, they discovered a copy of the Book of the Law. Now, what would be the Book of the Law? One of the books of Moses. Yeah. Would it have to be one of the books of Moses? We don't know for sure which one it was. Most scholars looking at this do think it was probably the Book of Deuteronomy. And it may have been, it may have been multiple scrolls. It might even have been all the books of Moses. We do not know for sure which book that was, but it is likely that it was the Book of Deuteronomy. Does it when, mean, what does it mean they discovered? This means that there was junk piled in the temple and they didn't even realize that a book of, a part of God's word was, was, was lost somewhere in there. So they're in there cleaning things up, refurbishing the temple and some, guess what, there's a scroll here. Wonder what it says. So they did not have access to this scroll, is that? Well, that's, we don't that's know. What, that's what it certainly appears, doesn't it? Well, hold up, hold on just a minute. Where were the original scrolls kept? that Moses wrote? Kept in the, in the covenant box. In a, not actually in the box, in but the in, a, in a little thing, a bag, apparently on the side of the covenant box. So the original scroll should have been in the most holy place. Now, I don't know. Where nobody could get at them. Nobody could get at them. But there were copies. That's what we're finding here. So, but are we drawing, are we drawing the, do we normally draw the conclusion that because they were surprised to find this here, and and they brought it out and started reading it, and were were they amazed with what they what they found there? So that intimates that they didn't know what was there, that they didn't have a copy of this, that they had lost it, ignored it. Uh, I don't know whether I can find it really quickly, but let me just show you something here. Um, go back to Deuteronomy. I believe it's twenty seven. And if it, had, if it had that much significance, then it's likely that they didn't know about the others as well. Yeah. Well, what were the scribes doing? <clears throat> yeah. Get to Jeremiah 8.8. 8. How can you say we are wise and yeah. the law of the Lord is with us, but behold, the false pen of the scribes has made it into a lie. 27.11 is the curses of disobedience, and then yeah. 28 is the blessing. But there's a place here, it's maybe a little bit, for maybe it's 29. Who was supposed um, to be doing the teaching here? In those days or right here, right now? <laughs> no, no. In those days, what was, 
Yeah, exactly. They didn't even know where the textbooks were. Exactly. <laughs> uh, I can't find the verse right now, but uh, it's 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 somewhere around twenty. I think it must be twenty nine. Uh, there's a verse which says, "When you settle in this land and you decide to make yourself a king, against my wishes, make sure that that king keeps a copy of God's word beside him and reads it every day." How would things be different? if they had done that. Well, Josiah, when the book was, came out, what happened, when they found this book, what did they do? When the people working on the temple brought the book to the king and read it to him, the king tore his clothes in dismay. What does that tell you? He was pretty disturbed, right? Mm -hmm. Josiah sought God's advice by sending his counselors to consult with Huldah. Who's that? Sounds like a female. It is a female. A female prophetess living in Jerusalem, one of the ones she telling them what was going on. She didn't have access to one of these books either? Well, we don't know. Apparently, if so, then she wasn't telling. <laughs> God's response was that while the terrible consequences of their sins would eventually catch up with Jerusalem, it would not happen in the days of Josiah because he had turned to the Lord, he would die in peace. There were two aspects to Josiah's reform. First of all, he did his best to get rid of all the traces of pagan idol worship, not only in his southern kingdom of Judah, but also in the northern kingdom of Israel, which is now no longer the northern kingdom of Israel. It's now called what? Samaria, uh, which is normally under the rule of the Assyrians. Secondly, after hearing the book of the law read to him, he made a covenant to have it read also to all his people and committed all of them to return to their obedience to the Lord. Imagine what's going on there. Uh, Josiah, well, unfortunately, Josiah made a mistake. He, he brought his people back and he continued to rule for another 11 years or so and things went well. But when Josiah made the mistake of going down into the Jordan Valley, a little while later, 609, what's happening? Do we, anybody know what's happening? Fighting Egypt. Well, Egypt is trying to reassert its, its power over all the nations. We talked about that in our last lesson. And so a big army of Egyptians are heading up the valley. They're passing through uh, the Jordan Valley, headed north, because they're, they're determined to, to to fight and conquer a waning Assyrian power, and they're hopefully also going to be able to conquer the, the Babylonians. And Jerob, unfortunately, Josiah felt like God had called him. I wish he had paid a little more attention to God's advice, but he felt that God had called him to go out there and, and uh, you know, stop this king, fight against him, and what happened? He was killed. He was killed. He was hit by an Egyptian arrow, 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 and, and died. Yeah. When Josiah made the mistake of going down into the Jordan Valley to fight against King Necho of Egypt, he was wounded by an Egyptian arrow and died. Jehoiaz, his 20-year-old son, succeeded him. For reasons that are not spelled out to us, Jehoiaz opposed Egyptian politics. When the Pharaoh came back from the north, he deposed Jehoiaz after three months, taking him to Egypt, where he died. So, the, north, the king goes north, the, the Egyptian king goes north past Israel. The good king Josiah goes out to fight him and man, manages to get himself killed. The, the Egyptian king um, uh, puts in a, uh, no, I mean, sorry, they put in the, his, Je Josiah's son becomes the next king. When the, when the Egyptians come back, what does he do? He takes that guy and, off and puts him off into, down, takes him down to Egypt where he dies and puts another king, Jehoiakim. king. Jehoiakim to be the new ruler. Uh, so that king was only, a rule, only ruled for three months. But Jehoiakim was just as evil as his brother had been and did not do as his father had done. He oppressed the poor, failed to pay people their just wages, and even killed innocent people. He was oppressive, even imposing heavy taxes on the people. 2 Kings 23-35. So that, w was that, was it Egypt that, that deposed him, or was it uh, Nebuchadnezzar? No, it was Nebuchadnezzar. Yeah. Yeah. That might, Nebuchadnezzar was the one who, who came down 
conquered the place and set up. So there was a big battle of Carchemish, yeah. and then Babylon came on down and after destroying Egypt. No, actually, Egypt. did I? No, it was. The, I'm sorry. It was the Egyptian king that set up Jehoiakim. It was the Egyptian yeah. king that set up Jehoiakim. He lived through the first before, during, and after the first conquest of of Babylon. Okay. So what does he do? He imposed, imposed a heavy tribute on all the people. What was, it, what, did, what was he doing with the tribute? He had to pay these, all this money to the Egyptians. Unfortunately, Jehoiakim also allowed the idolatrous, practice to flir, idol, to, idolatrous practices to flourish once again in his kingdom. And make a little tax money off that. Well, Jehoiakim is compared very unfavorably with his father Josiah in Jeremiah 22, 16, where it says, He, that is Josiah, the good king we've been, we were talking about, gave the poor a fair trial, and all went well with them. That is what it means to know the Lord. Does giving the poor a fair trial mean knowing the Lord? What's the relationship between those two? How are they not getting a fair trial? Well, no, very simple. The rich would come along and slip yeah. the the judge a few shekels, and the and poor the, would the, the decision would go against yeah, uh, exactly. the just claim of the poor. Exactly. Yeah. <clears throat> I mean, it's it's spelled out very clearly in Scripture. That's what was happening. Yeah. But what does this have to do with knowing the Lord? Does it really? giving a, a fair trial to the poor, does that really give us a, a better knowledge of God? Or is it that when you know God more and you choose to do things in God's way, you do give a fair trial to the poor? That's right doing, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Righteousness, justice. Does that remind you of anybody else's words in Scripture? Jesus Christ. Matthew 25, verse 40. The king will reply, I tell you, Whenever you did, you did this for one of the least important of these members of my family, <clears throat> you did it for me. Okay? Is it not true that how we relate to others around us reveals a great deal about us? So now what are we talking about? We're talking about those last four kings, right? The 19th king of Judah was Jehoiachin, son of Jehoiakim. He only ruled for three and a half months in the year 598 B.C. And what happened in 598 B.C.? Nebuchadnezzar came back. Jehoiakim, the one who had been ruling for what, about 11 years or something like that, uh, was deposed. Jehoiachin was put in place. And when Nebuchadnezzar returned, bringing his forces to Israel, he exiled almost all the people. He took. And, and what happened to most of the people in Judah in 598 during the times? Now, remember, Daniel and his three friends are already in Babylon. They're already over there and learn the language and all that kind of stuff. So now this is a second invasion, the second siege. What happens? Most of the rest go. Almost the entire population of Judah is, Nebuchadnezzar says, I'm fed up with this kind of stuff. He took almost the entire population. And, and, and took them over to, into, into basically slavery, into servanthood. So he, he came down for the first siege and took uh, the most prosperous... Right. Uh, uh, Members of the king's family, the right. smartest young men, yeah. Right, and, uh, and left instructions for Israel to behave itself. Yes. And they um, didn't pay any attention to those instructions, so he came back a second time. Yeah. And uh, that's the time you're referring to now. So then it takes practically everybody else. Yeah. Including the new king, who's only been there for three and a half months. Okay. And he takes him over there. He's 18 years old. Takes him along with his mother, his wives, and many other captives. And they go into, the, into, the, into Babylon. In fact, and they were, they were, a lot of them were, were sent to a place at, near the Kibar River, which is a little bit south of Babylon. So we're going to find out here there's going to be a third siege. Yes. So Nebuchadnezzar comes back, comes three times yep. and, uh, and uh, conquers. Well, it's uh, interesting to note that 37 years later, Jehoiachin was given 
mercy by evil Merodach, Nebuchadnezzar's successor. He was actually granted the right to dine with the king of Babylon and wear his usual, usual kingly robes. You can read about that in 2 Kings 25, 27 to 30. So here's a king who rules, Israel, rules Judah for three and a half months. He's taken off by the king of Babylon, some kind of confinement or whatever, for 37 years. And I said, maybe got, he had pity on him as he was developing gray hairs. He said, no, you can come over here and sit at my table. And so Jehoiachin finally ended up under good circumstances. Well, under God's instruction, Jeremiah wrote a letter to be sent to the exiles in Babylon. It is recorded in Jeremiah 29, 1-14. Let's look at that for a and, moment. And all this time, Jeme Jeremiah is left behind. Jeremiah is still in, in <coughs> Jerusalem, or near Jerusalem. I wrote a letter to the priests, the prophets, the leaders of the people, and to all the others whom Nebuchadnezzar had taken away as prisoners from Jerusalem to Babylonia. <coughs> I wrote it after King Jehoiachin, his mother, the palace officials, the leaders of Judah and of Jerusalem, the craftsmen and the skilled workmen had been taken into exile. Okay, so how many are gone? Almost everybody. I gave the letter to Elisa, son of Shaphan, and to Gemariah, son of Hilkiah, whom King Zedekiah of Judah was sending to King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylonia. So who's the, the new king now? Zedekiah. Zedekiah. And he's sending some messengers over to Babylonia, probably to carry tribute money. And so Jeremiah does what? Gives him a letter to take on the way, take with him, right? It said, and I quote, The Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says to all those people whom he allowed Nebuchadnezzar to take away as prisoners from Jerusalem to Babylonia, build houses and settle down. Plant gardens and eat what you go in them. Marry and have children. Then let your children get married so that they also may have children. Now, Jeremiah already knows how long are they going to be there? Seventy years. Seventy years. Okay. It's, is it reasonable to consider that Jeremiah was left behind by Nebuchadnezzar because Jeremiah was telling the people of Israel, according to God's instruction, look, exactly. don't irritate this guy. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and the Babylonians, even when they came down there, they knew that this is, I mean, the people got captured. They said, oh, there's a prophet back there telling the king he's supposed to. So the Babylonians said, this guy's got his act together. He knows what's going on. When did uh, Jeremiah send the letter about the good and bad figs? That's, that comes later. We, we haven't got to that yet. And that must be, uh, that must have been kind of impressive to, uh, to Nebuchadnezzar and yeah. And his, uh, yeah. his, his leaders, that there was somebody down there who was saying the God of Israel has said, he was probably getting this information, mm -hmm. that they're going to be here. That guy says they're going to be here for 70 years. And you suppose that they even heard about <clears throat> him, God calling Nebuchadnezzar his servant? Well, I would think so. I would think uh, yeah, I would think Nebuchadnezzar would consider that pretty good political capital. Mm -hmm. And when he when he uh, uh, conversed with the with the with okay. the nation down there, well, but let's what they read the rest doing. of the letter here. You must increase in numbers and not decrease. Work for the good of the cities where I have made you go as prisoners. Pray to me on their behalf. Now these are people that are so wicked that God is having to let them go, and he's telling them to do what? Pray for them. Pray for the Babylonians, right? Wow. Uh, because if they are prosperous, you'll be prosperous too. I, the Lord, the God of Israel, warn you not to let yourselves be deceived by the prophets who live among you or by any others who claim they can predict the future. Do not pay any attention to their dreams. They are telling you lies in my name. I did not send them. I, the Lord Almighty, have spoken. The Lord says, and here's the second prediction, when Babylonia's 70 years are over, I will show my concern for you and keep my promise to bring you back home. And if we had time to jump over to the book of Daniel, what would we learn? Maybe we should take a moment to, to look at that real quick. Look at Jan Daniel 9. Dur Darius the Mede, who was the son of Xerxes, ruled over the kingdom of Babylonia. In the first year of his reign, I was studying the sacred books and thinking about the 70 years that Jerusalem would be in ruins, according to what the Lord had told the prophet Jeremiah. 
And I prayed earnestly to the Lord God, pleading with him, fasting, wearing sackcloth, and sitting in ashes. So what is Daniel saying here? It's time for that 70 years to be up. Yeah. God, do your thing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, um, let's just finish up the last few... Except he said it a bit more penitently than I did. Really? He said, we have sinned, we have not listened to your servants, the prophets. You all, Lord, you always do what's right. Yeah. Etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, notice here in the last part of this passage I was reading here, I'm going to read from verse 10. The Lord says, when Babylon is seven years are over, we read that, I alone, verse 11, know the plans I have for you. Plans to bring you prosperity and not disaster. Plans to bring about the future you hope for. Then you will call to me. You will seek me and you will find me. No, you will call to me and, I'm sorry, then you will call to me. You will come and pray to me and I will answer you. You will seek me and you will find me because you will seek me with all your heart. Um, does that sound kind of like what God always wants of us? Just physical prosperity or spiritual prosperity? What do you think? Literal prosperity or Do you think there's a relationship between those two? Probably both, yeah. That has always been God's plan for us. Do you think those exiles in Babylon believed the words of Jeremiah? The people in Jerusalem didn't believe his words. Did God and Jeremiah give them some future hope? Of course, God's plan for all of us is that we go to heaven and live with him forever, isn't it? Well, Nebuchadnezzar replaced Jehoiachin that he took to Babylon with him by Zedekiah, the 21-year-old Zedekiah, who was actually his uncle, I believe. Unfortunately, Zedekiah was no better than his immediate predecessors. Look at 2 Chronicles 36, 14. In addition, the leaders of Judah, the priests and the people followed the sinful example of nations around them in worshiping idols, and so they defiled the temple. Which temple would that be? Jerusalem. Which the Lord himself had made holy. And then look at these really, really sad words. The Lord, the God of their ancestors, had continued to send prophets to warn his people because he wanted to spare them and the temple. But they ridiculed God's messengers ignoring his words and laughing at his prophets until at last the Lord's anger against his people was so great that there was no escape. What does that tell you? Who's turning against who? The people turned against God and God eventually said, if that's what you insist on, I will let you have it. Yeah. Well, what do you think Jeremiah was talking about when he said they were doing all the abominations of the pagans? Everything that we discussed earlier. Yeah. Worshipping these fertility gods, right? Well, look at what happens next. This is absolutely incredible to me. Look at Jeremiah 38 now. We're going to jump over a little bit. The book, the book of Jeremiah, by the way, is not organized chronologically. You have to sort of, if you're following the story, you have to kind of jump around a little bit. And why was that? Well, it burned up. And his first copy was burned by the king. On another occasion, King Zedekiah had me brought to him at the third entrance to the temple. And he said, I'm going to ask you a question and I want you to tell me the whole truth. So, what does this tell us? Zedekiah is secretly approaching who? Jeremiah. Jeremiah. And why is he approaching him? He needs help. He needs help and he wants to know the truth, doesn't he? Yeah. He wants to know the yeah. truth. I answered, if I tell you the truth, you will put me to death. And if I give you advice, you won't pay any attention. <laughs> I mean, how blunt can you be, right? Yeah. <laughs> so King Zedekiah promised me in secret, I swear by the living God, the God who gave us life, that I will not put you to death or hand you over to the men who want to kill you. Because there were other people who wanted to kill him. Then I told Zedekiah that the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, had said, If you surrender to the king of Babylonia's officers, your life will be spared and this city will not be burnt down. 
both you and your family will be spared. But if you do not surrender, then this city will be handed over to the Babylonians who will burn it down and you will not escape from them. But the king answered, I am afraid of our countrymen who have deserted to the Babylonians. I may be handed over to them and tortured. He really didn't so, know. who is he thinking about? Himself. He cannot Everyone. think about anything except himself. He well, certainly didn't have it, any confidence in the message that Jeremiah brought, saying that he's going to live. If he, if he. I don't know whether. I mean. I, I don't. It's hard for me to imagine what the guy was thinking. It's really hard for me to imagine what the guy was thinking. Well, the king clearly wanted to know what God had to say about his future, but he was not willing to reform. Jeremiah told him that he could simply surrender to Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, who had put him in the position of king in the first place. Nebuchadnezzar was the one who pointed him to that position. It's kind of treason, isn't it? Yes. To give up, the king to give up. And as a result, the city and the temple would be spared. But he refused. As a result, a short time later, after a terrible siege, Zedekiah, his family, and his high officials tried to escape through a secret passage out through the wall of Jerusalem. But they were captured, and Zedekiah's sons and many of his high officials were murdered before his eyes, and then his eyes were put out. Do you think he wishes he had listened to Jeremiah? Did he have that much insight to yeah. even consider that? <laughs> yeah. probably complained about the pain. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, come on, he must have had that much insight at least. Why do you think it was so hard for Zedekiah to follow the advice of Jeremiah? What did he say might happen to him? He might, he might be tortured. He might be turned over to some of the Israelites who had already been conquered by the Babylonians, and they might torture him. How often they, He was worried about what they would think. How often do we make serious mistakes because we are afraid of, afraid of what other people might think? We don't need any confessions right now, but... It almost appears that um, things were so bad that he was largely a powerless king anyway, even among his own, well, his I mean, own people. The, the city of Jerusalem had been under siege for what, two and a half years or something like that? The entire rest of the kingdom of Judah was gone. I mean, it was already conquered. The only people who were left were the people inside those walls. Wow. Are we afraid to proclaim God's message to those around us because we are afraid of what they might think of us? Everything that has been prophesied by the prophets against Jerusalem came to pass. But even in that disaster, there was some comforting words from God. Look at Jeremiah 23, verses 2 through 8. How terrible will be the Lord's judgment on those rulers who destroy and scatter his people. This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says about the rulers who are supposed to take care of his people. You have not taken care of my people. You have scattered them and driven them away. Now I am going to punish you for the evil you have done. I will, get, uh, I will gather the rest of my people from the countries where I have scattered them, and I will bring them back to their homeland. They will have many children and increase in number. I will appoint rulers to take care of them. My people will no longer be afraid or terrified, and I will not punish them again. I, the Lord, have spoken. The Lord says, The time is coming when I will choose as king a righteous descendant of David. That king will rule wisely and do what is right and just throughout, right and just throughout the, the land. When he is king, the people of Judah will be safe and the people of Israel will live in peace. He will be called the Lord our salvation. That's who, which descendant do you think he's talking about? Jesus. Yeah. The time is coming, says the Lord, when people will no longer swear by me as a living God who brought the people of Israel out of the land of Egypt. Instead, they will swear by me as the living God who brought the people of Israel out of a northern land and out of all the other countries where I have scattered them. Then they will live in their own land. And that's <clears throat> in Jerusalem. Not in the earthly Jerusalem. 
Well, um, what was the state of the nation of Judah after the third siege and conquest by Nebuchadnezzar? Rubble. The entire nation had been destroyed. Not one city was left standing. Jerusalem was left as nothing but a pile of rubble. And I quote, the dark years of destruction and death marking the end of the kingdom of Judah would have brought despair to the stoutest heart had it not been for the encouragements and the prophetic utterances of God's messengers. Through Jeremiah and Jerusalem, through Daniel in the court of Babylon, through Ezekiel in the banks of Kibar, the Lord in mercy made clear his eternal purpose and gave assurance of his promise, rec promises recorded in the writings of Moses. That which he had said he would do for those who should prove true to him, he would surely bring to pass. The word of God liveth and abideth forever, 1 Peter 1.23. And that's Prophets and Kings 4.64. And so the surrounding nations who <coughs> often believe that the strength of the, the nation was dependent upon the strength of the God, mm -hmm. probably uh, did, did not have a very good, um, we're not very impressed with the God of the Israelites. But I will have to tell you that all the nations around there, I mean, Nebuchadnezzar just rolled roughshod over every nation, every one of those nations, Edom and Moab and, 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 and all of them were taken, were conquered by Nebuchadnezzar. Well, I'll read you another passage. In the closing years of Judah's apostasy, the exhortations of the prophets were seemingly of but little avail. And as the armies of the Chaldeans came for the third and last time to besiege Jerusalem, hope fled from every heart. And I already said they were under siege for how long? Two and a half years at least. Jeremiah predicted utter ruin, and it was because of his insistence on surrender that he had finally been thrown into prison. So what did they do to him? He said, please, he begged them, please, just go out and surrender to the Babylonians. They're not going to kill you, you know? That's what God wants you to do at this point in time, to, to solve the problem. No, what did they do with him? They threw him in prison. But God left not to hopeless despair the faithful remnant who were still in the city. Even while Jeremiah was, was kept under close surveillance by those who scorned his messages, there came to him fresh revelations concerning heaven's willingness to forgive and to save, which had been an unfailing source of comfort to the Church of God from that day to this. Prophets and Kings 466, paragraph 1. So what do you think the universe looking on thought of heaven's willingness to forgive and to save? If you had been one of the angels in heaven, you watched the children of Israel. God has you know, Abraham. Think about the Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, the children of Israel into slavery. God takes them out of Israel. He does the Sinai thing. He you know, brings them into the land after... 40 years of rebellion and so forth and so forth. He finally gets them into the land and they just go from bad to worse to worse. They might have been very confused up until the life and death of Jesus. The people up, upstairs, the angels, yeah. Wow. Well, what do you think the universe looking on is thinking about us today? We're here two thousand years after the ministry and death of Jesus and over 170 years following the great disappointment in 1844. What are we waiting for? Well, look at Jeremiah 42, verse 2. And said to me, please do what we ask you. Please do what we ask you. Pray to the Lord our God for us. Pray for all of us who have survived. Once there were many of us, but now only a few of us are left, as you can see. Who's talking? Who's, who's requesting this? People. Try to imagine. There's a few poor people that, that Nebuchadnezzar left in the land. People who were so poor they didn't own anything. You know, Nebuchadnezzar says, it's not worth even carrying these people off to Babylon. Just leave them. Mm. And so what did they do? Those people? They came to Jeremiah and their little, their little remnant. Please pray for us. Think it worked? 
Well, what do we know about remnants in the Bible? Remnants are going to be saved, isn't that what it says? Well, look at Isaiah 10, verses 22 and 23. Even though now there are as many people of Israel as there are grains of sand by the sea, only a few will come back. And what are those few called? Remnant. Remnant. Destruction is in store for the people, and it is fully deserved. Yes, throughout the whole country, the Sovereign Lord Almighty will bring destruction, as he said he would. And look at Romans 9:27. In response to that, Paul wrote, and Isaiah exclaims about Israel, even if the people of Israel are as many as the grains of sand by the sea, yet only a few of them will be saved. So, who's that talking about? What time in history? Sounds like the end time. Yeah. Hopefully yeah. us. Yeah. Try to imagine yourself living through the terrible times of Jeremiah. We've not even started to discuss many of the terrible things that happened to him. I mean, he was thrown down into the bottom of a, a mucky, a muddy well. He was even told not to marry. Jeremiah, you can't marry. How do you think God felt about those events? I mean, what, what is God saying to the angels as all this is going on? He's saying, they don't want me. I'm going to give them their freedom. I will let them go. Was you think there was weeping in heaven? Why did the descendants of Josiah so quickly turn back to the evil ways of Manasseh and Haman? Well, let me go ahead. Can you comment? Well, you know, there were, as we mentioned, there was a, a bit of a good remnant, just as God may have been saying in the time of Job, look at Job, how righteous he is, and about Abraham the same thing, as he lived in Canaan, a very idolatrous uh, uh, atmosphere to be in. Look how faithful Abraham is. He may have been saying about Daniel and Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego and mm -hmm. others that were there that we don't know their names. Um, look at these people who, regardless of the terrible circumstances that are res resulting here, and they are getting even um, have to suffer with, um, look how faithful that they, they still are. Mm -hmm. We got in weeping in heaven. I think there were a <coughs> lot of weeping in heaven because it says how they rejoice when one sinner repents. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine the pain when all these people reject God? Yeah. Well, we know today that there are officially on the books about 20 million Seventh-day Adventists around the world. Would you call that a remnant? Well, that's a whole lot more than 144,000. We ought to be there. <laughs> but compared to the population of the <laughs> Earth, it's a remnant. Well, I'm going to take a moment. We've got still a couple of minutes. Look at Psalm 74, first eight verses, and it talks a little bit about this terrible things that were happening. Why have you abandoned us like this, O God? Will you be angry with your own people forever? Remember your people whom you chose for yourself long ago, whom you brought out of slavery to be your own tribe. Remember Mount Zion where once you lived. Walk over these total ruins. What do we say about Jerusalem? We left a pile of rubble, right? Walk over these total ruins. Our enemies have destroyed everything in the temple. Your enemies have shouted in triumph in your temple. They have placed their flags there as signs of victory. They look like woodmen cutting down trees with their axes. What are they cutting down? Pillars of the temple. The pillars of the temple. They smashed all the wooden panels with their axes and sledgehammers. They wrecked your temple and set it on fire. They desecrated the place where you are worshipped. They wanted to crush us completely. They burnt down every holy place in the land. Well, what do we know about what happened to the rest of Israel at that point in time? Here's a, yeah, go ahead. The rest of Judah. Yeah, did I say Israel? I'm sorry, the rest of Judah. 
Lachish was the second most important city in Judah after Jerusalem during much of the Old Testament history. It was surrounded by vineyards and towered over one of the valleys that provided access to Jerusalem from the south, southern Judah and Egypt, of course. Archaeology has provided a rare glimpse into the last days of the kingdom of Judah when Nebuchadnezzar marched on Jerusalem in order to destroy it. And if you ever have a chance to visit um, the, the British Museum in London, there's a whole room there where there's carvings and paintings that talks about the attack on, on Lachish. In 1935, John Starkey excavated the destruction layer caused by Nebuchadnezzar's army in Jerusalem. And among the debris that covered the floor of a guard room in a monumental gate that provided access to the city, so remember how that was? They would, there would be gates and then there were there were gates, and then there would be places for guards to be, and then there'd be a little break, and then there'd be another gate. So in one of those areas that provided access to the city, a number of inscribed pieces of pottery, or ostraca, were found, which became known as the Lachish Letters. They dramatically described the final moments of the southern kingdom as Nebuchadnezzar systematically destroyed all important cities until only Jerusalem was left. In letter four, we read, and may my Lord know that we keep on the lookout for the fire signals of Lachish. What do you suppose that means? We're looking for signs of life. They were hoping that Lachish was still standing. The letter was possibly sent from Jerusalem by a watchman who was frantically looking for a sign of life coming from Lachish, which would have been communicated by fire signals during the night. It is likely that there was no response to the letter as it was found in between burned ash layers, toppled over storage jars, and Babylonian arrowheads. God was executing judgment on Judah and Jerusalem with its temple to be destroyed next. How do you understand a loving God sending the Babylonians to judge his people? Wasn't there a siege there before they finally... Yeah, two and a half years. Yeah. And then there was a ramp. They built a ramp they built to, ramps get up, up. To, to get up This there. was to Jerusalem, not, not Lachish. Well, probably Lachish, no, I too. Think, I think it was Lachish yeah. out there yeah, in, the, yeah. in the valley. Yeah. But what do you think happened between Josiah and all those wicked descendants of his? Did they just not have any backbone? Or did he do a poor job of training them? Well, we, we read about the great religious form, reform that occurred in the days of Josiah because they discovered what was probably the book of Deuteronomy and read it first to the king and then to the people. Why do you think that result resulted in such a reform? I think because king, he dared to do the right thing. He didn't just go with whatever wind that blew. Well, how do we... Yeah. Part of it was that Deuteronomy reminded the people of the blessings of obedience and the curses of disobedience. Mm -hmm. And they said, that's where, that's where things come from, so we better listen. Okay, now I want you to listen to these words. Think about them. We look back at their evil ways, their idolatry, their injustice, etc., and we think that those people were certainly wicked. But notice how they responded to the reading of God's Word. What kind of response would we get in our day to the public reading of the book of Deuteronomy? Sneering. And the ignoring apathy. By jeering. Some people would yeah. jeer. You know, when they, in a way, isn't this just the eventual consequences of what happens to uh, a monarchy? God told them, didn't He tell them this is what was going to happen if they if they decided they wanted to go have kings? That this is basically what where they yeah. would end up. Well, I mean, this is just yeah, the nature yeah. of a monarchy. In the demise of both the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah, two things are mentioned repeatedly. First is the idolatry. It seems that the people who were, were worshiping presumably at the temple on Sabbath but they were worshiping in the pagan fertility cult temples during the rest of the week. And of course, we already read that they were preparing cakes for the Queen of Heaven in the temple itself. How is that possible? 
Did they think they were just getting double fire insurance? Did they think the worshiping at the fertility cult temples that were scattered throughout the land would make their crops grow better and their animals more productive? That's what those pagan priests told them. What did the priests in the temple in Jerusalem say to them about all that? Or were they afraid to even mention it? And their second sin, mentioned so frequently, was their injustice to the poor, to widows, and to orphans. Are we involved in any way in social injustice in our day? Do we need to be involved more in social justice issues? Should we be marching in the streets? Are we involved in some kind of modern idolatry? How does God feel about most of the material on television in our day? Do we dare to ask that question? How does he feel about the movies that are shown on movie theaters and in so many homes in the forms of DVDs and Blu-ray discs? Is rebellion just as rampant among God's professed people today as it was in Jeremiah's day? Do you think God is about to call a remnant people out of his church today? No, that couldn't happen to the Adventist church, could it? If it happened, how could we make sure that we're a part of the remnant? Well, we know that there's three things, and to just review them once more, there's Bible study, there's prayer, there's witnessing, and those are the things that God asks us to do, and every one of us has a chance to be a part of it. Our kind and loving Father, we thank you so much for the privilege of studying your word, of becoming more like you. We ask that you'll be with us as we seek to carry out the, the, the words that you've asked us to, to do is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.